Thank you so much for that introduction, Ben. And thank you so much to the organizers and the sponsors for this conference. I've been able to attend all day and it's truly amazing. And I'm definitely looking forward to exploring the wealth of resources in the lightning talks. So I would encourage everyone to do that as well. I'm so excited to be here with you on a Friday afternoon. Uh, I'm a little hungry after looking at all the snacks in the chat, but we'll just power through. Hopefully some of you have access to some of those snacks, but uh, I'm really excited to be with you today to talk about something that has become an accidental passion of mine, which is working with generative artificial intelligence. And I'm hoping in some ways that we'll be a little interactive today as well. So uh, I'm going to encourage you to participate in a survey and also to contribute to a Google Doc where we can create a summer reading list for ourselves. So again, thank you for being here. And uh, I'm looking forward to learning from you as well. So if you have ideas, please feel free to put them in the chat. Hopefully we'll have some time for some questions at the end. So first, while we're getting going, uh, I have a few warm up slides. And uh, if we can, I think we have that survey link in the chat. And also Mandy shared the link to the slides in the chat. And I'll put these in the Discord server as well. Well, I've designed this slide deck to include links to quite a few different resources for you to check out. I hope that you'll leave today having uh, some resources and some ideas about ways that you might use generative AI, both in your classroom and also in your own professional practice. Uh, for example, Ben mentioned that I was just promoted and I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I did take a little bit of a risk and I used several generative artificial intelligence tools, cited, acknowledged, and linked to them in my promotion packet. So. <laughs> I guess we it turned out okay in my case, but it was certainly I, I was a little concerned to see how our administration would handle that. Uh, so we'll look at these survey results in just a minute. Several of you have already taken it, and I appreciate that. But uh, first, I'll demonstrate a use of ChatGPT 4.0, the new model. I had grades due this week, y'all, so I've had hardly any time to process the incredible changes that have hit us just this week on Monday and Tuesday with OpenAI's announcement and then Google's announcement. Uh, some of the things that Google announced already integrated into my Gmail account, my Google Drive, so I'm looking forward to exploring more. But the very first thing I did with ChatGPT 4.0, the new model that they released, was to help develop these learning outcomes. Uh, so that just shows you, you know, one way that that we might leverage these tools. Uh, when we know what we want to present, we can chat with the, uh, the AI resources to kind of get some ideas about how to put that into you know, uh, this type of language, right? That can be really template language. So before we get started, though, I, I start every presentation that I give with a note about ethics. And uh, this has been important to me since these tools were, were first released. So I include this statement about ethics that was inspired by Lori Phipps and Donna Lanclose's work. I acknowledge that generative AI does not respect the individual rights of authors and artists and ignores concerns over copyright and intellectual property in its training. Additionally, I acknowledge that these systems were trained in part through the exploitation of precarious workers in the global south. For this presentation, I specifically used Microsoft Copilot, Google Gemini, and ChatGPT to assist with image design, create survey questions, refine learning outcomes, and respond to sample prompts. Uh, and I, when I teach with generative artificial intelligence, I always start with this ethics note, and then also with a link to that essay, Surviving the Text Apocalypse, which actually grew out of a sermon that my husband's Unitarian Universalist Church asked me to give on artificial intelligence. If you know the UU, you'll know how not out of character that is. Uh, but, it, but I was really thinking about these issues last summer, like many of us, and uh, really my views haven't changed. I'm, as a writing instructor, as a writer myself, I'm, I'm really processing a lot of what's going on with these rapid changes in the, in the text technological tools that we have. Um, so when we think about ethics, one of the big concerns for me, as I mentioned in Surviving the Text Apocalypse, is climate change. But uh, another one that I'd like to share with you, if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to open this link, is that it just straight up makes stuff up. Right? So I asked ChatGPT 3.5 back in November of 2023 to write a biography of me. And uh, if you didn't know me or know anything about me, this biography looks fine. It looks really normal. But in fact, a lot of this is made up. <laughs> it's completely made up. I, am, I was not born in Pocatello. I'm super offended that ChatGPT thinks I'm older than I actually am. 
Uh, I, it's great that I have a master's degree in creative writing from Boise State. I do not. Maybe I aspire to that someday. They have an excellent program. Uh, but some of this is also true, right? So I, I have written a book. I have. I did write this essay. I have been the board president for NAMI, and I, I've been a crisis intervention team coordinator working with uh, law enforcement. Uh, the thing I'm most excited about for this summer is it suggested that I've written this wonderful memoir, great title. <laughs> I thought, yeah, you know, maybe I'll have Claude AI write that for me this summer. That might be really fun. So, so I always bring that up because I think it's important uh, whatever work we do, both to frame ourselves, frame our own position ourselves within our ethical concerns, um, and, and to not shy away from those concerns, perhaps even more now than, uh, than in previous times because of the rapid advances and changes that we're seeing. Uh, and we need to model that for our students. A lot of the things I'll share today, I think we also need to model with our students. So you can check out at another time my actual biography, <laughs> the, the real facts. And then I recently started a Substack. I'm very late to the game. I'm a very lazy blogger. Uh, but I've been doing a lot of work with artificial intelligence, both in my professional life and also in the classroom. And I decided I wanted a, a free way to share this out with the world. Almost all the work that I do is openly licensed because I'm very passionate about open. Uh, and so if you find anything that's useful to you there, it's all Creative Commons licensed and, and feel free to, to take anything that, that you find that might help you. All right, so. <laughs> Those of you who are Generation X, I hope you recognize this, this image from one of my favorite movies, Real Genius with Val Kilmer, right? When I first started playing around with these tools, this is where I was. So November 2022, I was a department chair of integrated studies. I oversaw the philosophy program, heard about ChatGPT and thought, huh, I wonder if it can write our signature assignment for our philosophy classes. Plugged in the prompt and sure enough, it could. It could write it great. So I thought, wow, is this where we're headed as writers and educators? And I immediately thought of this scene from Real Genius where uh, the students all send their tape recorders into class and then the teacher sends in a tape recorder to lecture to the tape recorders. And that's certainly what we don't want to have happen. So let's take a look at where we all are with AI right now. I'm going to just show the responses. Thank you to everyone who's taken this. Uh, and so like, I'm really happy for this group and not surprised given that we're all in open uh, to not see any green here that no student should not use generative AI in any way. Uh, but however, some of you may have colleagues, I certainly do. I mentioned I was the department chair that oversaw philosophy. Uh, if my philosophy professors had taken this survey, we would actually have a, a fair contingent of green here. Uh, there are some faculty members also in my own Department of English who are really adamant that generative AI is not appropriate for use. So uh, I'm glad to see that you all feel like it is, but we can see there's a little disagreement in how we feel about how to use it in the classroom. So about 7% of us say, yeah, whatever they wanna do, right? Some of us say, yeah, there's they can use it, but there's probably some limitations. And then some of us are, are saying, yeah, if they cite and acknowledge the use of AI, that's where, that's where I personally am, spoiler alert. I, I think if they're citing and acknowledging, and if I'm modeling that, I think we're in good shape. Um, I'm not gonna drill down into all these things, except I was actually kind of happy to see that most of you feel the way that I do, uh, that writing a response to a classmate's discussion board post, for example, would be something we wouldn't want to use generative AI for. Uh, I could give a whole other lecture, and I have, for Idaho about privacy concerns and these tools. And what I tell my own students is, please do not copy and paste anybody else's work. You know, you, what, with your own work, you're the owner of it, you can do what you want. And I also make that commitment to them that I will not copy and paste their work into a large language model without their explicit written permission. So I do feel like informed consent has been something we've been missing all along <laughs> with, with tech innovations. And now we have a chance to push back with artificial intelligence and to, to really be mindful of terms of service, be mindful of privacy, and to make our students mindful of that as well. So yeah, lots of interesting stuff here. And you'll be able to see these responses too. So, so many great things. Then of course, I asked about faculty. So should we be able to use it? And again, yeah, we feel like we feel like we should be able to use it, right? Um, one comment that stood out to me early that someone had posted this a few days ago was model the behavior you expect in your students and always check the guidelines of journals, conferences, and other contexts. I actually have a line like that similar in uh, similar in this presentation to that 
ideology, that philosophy toward it. So uh, this and these other comments about really needing human oversight, that is so true at this point. So keeping that in mind. And then finally, and we'll come back to this idea. It seems like most of you are where I am with this situation that we find ourselves in. We know it's gonna impact higher education. I think we've all gotten that memo at this point, but we just aren't really sure. We're, we're kind of at a three. Should we be worried? Should we not be worried? Uh, I think a lot of us need more information. So I am hoping today to give you at least some things to experiment with uh, as, we, as we think about what role this will play in our classroom. So uh, I'm reading Co-Intelligence right now, Ethan Mollick's book. I haven't finished it, but uh, this quote really stood out at me when I thought about my own pedagogical approach, which is heavily centered in open pedagogy, probably like a lot of you here. Uh, when I first played with these tools, my first concern was, can this write our students' papers? Yes. Then th my immediate second thought was, how can this be a tool for digital equity? And this is a question I continue to ask myself uh, whenever I design an activity that brings generative artificial intelligence into the classroom. So one thing that Ethan Mollick has noticed, and he's he's been really ahead of the curve doing research in this area, he says, we already know one major effect of AI, it levels the playing field. That's that, that equity. In field after field, we're finding that humans working with an AI co-intelligence outperform all but the best humans working without AI. And, and Malik is really an advocate for this co-intelligence model for learning to use it. Um, uh, this has been what's informed my own use of bringing AI into the classroom. How can I make sure that my students who really need these tools the most are able to really um, leverage the, the, the huge benefits that these have. So speaking of Ethan Mollick and reading this book, um, Mandy, I think we probably put this in the chat already, but I'll put it in again. If you're somebody who needs something to do with your hands, if you need to color while you watch a presentation, maybe I'm speaking about myself. Uh, I've created a Google Doc for us that I'd like to crowdsource some of the things you are reading. I think one thing we can all agree on, there is a fire hose of information I've shared some of my favorite uh, thought leaders in the field, people like Anna Mills, uh, Mark Watkins, Ethan Mollick, of course, uh, people who I'm following. Um, and I did share my own Substack too. And again, I'm very new at it, but I'm trying to share a lot of resources there. So if you if you wanna take anything there that's useful, please find it. But I'm hoping you all can, oh, you're already doing it, good job. Give us your name and, and give us some of the things that you're doing um, at your within your professional practice or at your college or university uh, to, to, to read for the summer. So you're going to help me build my reading list and this will be shared out with everyone. And, and we'll, it'll be open throughout the presentation. So, all right, so let's get into teaching. I, I love this picture. Uh, I, I brought in AI very intentionally starting in fall of 2023. I decided that I was going to use a tool called My Essay Feedback, I'll talk a little bit about it, uh, to provide formative assessments for my students. And uh, so I, we started the class off you know, with me saying, okay, we're going to embrace these tools. We're going to use these tools. I did give an opt out for students and I always do. I think if students have strong ethical concerns about these tools, they, they should be allowed to opt out. I haven't had students take me up on that yet. So far they've all wanted to participate. So Caleb, we had Caleb's an art major, which you can kind of tell from this amazing picture, I think. And, and right after class, he went out to, we have these whiteboards all over in our, in our college. And uh, I teach at a community college in Idaho. He went right out to the whiteboard and started drawing this amazing piece of art for generative AI. And then I didn't get a picture of this, but he added a survey underneath where students could write comments or, you know, express how worried they were about generative artificial intelligence. And uh, he was very worried worried because he's going into art, but he discovered, he, he actually wrote two papers on it, and he discovered through those papers that he's probably still got quite a bit of job security. Uh, and you'll notice I've included some AI art throughout this presentation, and once in a while I'll comment on why my students like Caleb still have some job security. So <laughs> there are definitely still some issues with AI art. But I, I think it's important to not assume that our students know how to use these tools. Even though they've been around for a while, what I found with students when I survey them on the first day of class, even this spring, uh, is that many of them 
are may they may be familiar with the tool, but they've tried it out and they'll say, I, I can't get it to work. I don't see why it's this great thing. Uh, and this was kind of some insight I had early on as a writer. I thought these tools were amazing. I started using them right away. Right? <laughs> I was like, this is, I, I'm, I'm, sold, just like our keynote this morning, I'm sold on the co-writing model of, of uh, creation now. It's just become part of my process. But I realized, oh, because I'm a writer and because I'm used to problem formulation and I, I'm used to thinking in those terms, uh, I wasn't instantly good at these tools, but I, I got the hang of it pretty quickly, at least in terms of prompting and, and also being able to evaluate outputs. Our students don't necessarily have those skills. So one important thing to keep in mind is to make sure we're still teaching the skills our students need, right? Uh, writing can't just go away because writing is a process that teaches us how to think in a lot of ways. So uh, starting with the basics, not assuming that your students know how to use these tools, definitely not assuming that they want to use the tools to cheat. In fact, a few of my students said, well, we're scared to use these tools because we're afraid that you'll accuse us of teach of cheating. So setting up some ground rules early on saying, you know, we're not, I'm not going to accuse you of cheating. Uh, <laughs> right. We're, we're going to cite and acknowledge, we're going to learn how to use these tools together and use them ethically. That helped to create some a sense of security for my students. Uh, Joel and I last summer, we had both been playing around with it in the classroom in spring of 2023, and we decided we needed more formal training. So uh, that link there, what are LLMs, is an H5P, uh, it's Creative Commons licensed. It can build into any of your uh, learning management systems. And it really does walk either you, if you're not sure what an LLM is, or your students for sure, it walks them through uh, exactly what a large language model is, how it works, uh, you know, and then it gives them some basics of prompting and, and, and some use cases they might have. So that's a good place to start. Just don't assume your students are using it to cheat. Don't assume they use it at all. They may not know how to use it. Uh, and, and giving them that education piece up front, I think is important. The next thing I do in my classroom, I design reading assignments and class discussions around AI. So we are constantly engaging with these ideas and bringing in our concerns and sharing them. We cite and acknowledge right away, right from the start. And I model this behavior. So if I'm using generative artificial intelligence to help come up with discussion posts, for example, I'll, I'll model that and say, hey, I used AI for this. Uh, and, and that, again, gives them a little more confidence in like appropriate uses and then places they should cite and acknowledge. I shared out, I sh I'm sure you all have seen it, but it's just so useful. Lance Eaton early on crowdsourced some syllabus policies. Um, so if you're not sure or you haven't put a syllabus policy in yet, uh, that's definitely a good place to start. I would say you, you really need to have syllabus policies at this point. Whatever they are, that's up to you. Uh, and then I... Um, I, I am powered by spite, I'm, I'm going to admit to it. Uh, after a lengthy conversation with the philosophy faculty I mentioned before, one of them accused me of cheating the taxpayers of Idaho because I was allowing my students to use generative AI. So I created a syllabus training. <laughs> I spent my whole weekend inside. It was a lovely spring weekend, but I created a training that can be adapted to any syllabus policy. If your policy is no use whatsoever, you can adapt this training. And again, there's an H5P. There's a link to a folder that includes a paper written entirely by generative artificial intelligence uh, so that students can see the you know the limitations and drawbacks of this type of work uh, so so make sure that you have clear policies and also that you're that you're explaining and that your students know what the policies are uh, another thing I got this from youtuber Marcus Brownlee who I love he does a lot of product testing and like early reviews of technology and early on last year he, uh, showed, he said, you know, if you're going to use these tools, you need to find something you're an expert in and test the tool out on something that you're an expert in. So I just linked to his YouTube channel overall, but, but the, the specific thing that I use with my students, I, you know, it shows them how to test the limits. So I tell them early on, okay, we're going to play with these tools, find something you're an expert in, and then ask the tool. And what that does is it'll get stuff wrong, just like it got my biography wrong, right? And they'll be like, oh, this is not an all powerful tool. And it also helps them to think really critically about any of the outputs they get. So I think that's a good place to start. Uh, and hopefully some materials that will help you. Now, part of the hard part for me, I don't know what's been hardest for you, but for me, one of the hardest parts of this whole change has been 
that I've had to shift my thinking about assessments. But in some ways, it's also been an easy part because as a practitioner of open pedagogy, I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time anyway. So I think you all are probably already familiar with the idea of authentic assessments that comes from Grant Wiggins in 1990, uh, and also the idea of David Wiley's five R's and the renewable assignments. Uh, learning how to incorporate AI, I felt like particularly revisiting Wiggins's 1990 article, I thought, wow, we actually have some real opportunities uh, now that we have these supports and we have these content creation and, and generation supports from artificial intelligence, we can ask our students to do harder things and cooler things, right? So that's one way to approach your classroom uh, to think about how can I make my assignments really interesting and cool and challenging for students, even if they are using these tools, right? Because we can still do some really hard things, maybe more than we could do on our own, right? Um, and then also, as I've thought about these assessments, I've inevitably thought about how to make them part of contributing to open education resources. So I love to involve my students, bring them in as content creators and, and make them a part of the open community. I've linked to a bunch of different resources here. Um, one that I wanna share really quickly, Ryan Randall from Idaho State University developed this for my English 211 students. <laughs> You can tell how old it is because those of you who remember the joke when <laughs> we call it Boogie Mook Big Face after Bodie Mook Bow Face, it's uh, it's a very esoteric joke. That's that's Ryan and me. But this this is a really great research it's, resource. It's Creative Commons licensed, and what you can do is create. You can add your students to this press book. So my students actually create in press books, and you can see here's some examples. I'll create a part for them. And then um, there's just activities where they can play around and, and create their own stuff. So you'd want to copy this book, like clone it within the Pressbooks environment, and then you can use this to um, have teacher students. It's, it's worked really great. I've been using it with my students for this beginnings and endings class. Ryan developed this textbook for me because he's great that way. Um, so speaking of that group project, um, I, I want to show you that really quickly. This is very scalable, I think, to any discipline doing this type of a renewable assignment. So this is what we would call a renewable assignment. And um, it, it just breaks it down, the project parts. Students love this. They love, yes, they love a group project. And what they end up producing um, is this wonderful critical edition. We just had our most recent book launch party but uh, I was actually doing some research for the textbook I was writing and found this book five star rated in Merlot. So that was a fun day. But you can see I've been doing this project for a while and it, it's truly renewable because students go back in and fill in the gaps and also edit and revise each other's work from previous assignments. Then I can use these assignments as well as model essays for my own students. So in future classes. So it's it's been really fun to bring that in. Where we worked artificial intelligence into it this semester was with editing and revising. So uh, you know, that's back to that digital equity piece. I don't know that it really matters that much if you're good at standard American English anymore. <laughs> Maybe that's some of our fear, right? Like those of us, I guess, including me, who are really good at grammar, guess what? That's, that's not gonna set you apart in the, in the content creation world anymore because we have these tools. Uh, and then also, when you when you do this type of thing, uh, I, I do get um, information. This is for my English 102 class, but you can make a copy of this form if it would be helpful. And I just ask them, I explain briefly what Creative Commons licensing is. They can also choose to license all rights reserved, but they're giving me permission to republish their work. So I use this form for any students. Now, I'm not a lawyer. You should run that by your own college's legal department, but it helps me to keep track of the permissions from my students. It also helps me to keep track of who's contributed to the various publications that, that I've got going on. So. Lots of ideas there, I hope, and I'm hoping it's inspired some of you guys too as you're thinking about what you do in the classroom and maybe some of you can share some ideas in the chat too as we go and we can uh, return to that when we when we uh, have time for questions and conversation at the end, which I'm looking forward to. So the next part of my presentation, I said I wanted to talk about teaching, writing, and then creating. And writing for me uh, has been, the, the place I've been wrestling most with AI, but also using AI the most. So uh, 
and I don't feel like an expert in any way either, you all. <laughs> like, I'm always so amazed by the way other people are using artificial intelligence. I think, wow, that would be really great. So much of what I do, I, I think, has really just been on the fly. Uh, I'll show you in a minute the textbook that I wrote. One of my favorite things about this textbook, I, I linked to all of my chats, and I was so transparently awful at prompting <laughs> in the early days. Um, so it's fun for me to look back at that and say, wow, I really was not good at this, <laughs> and then to watch how I got better and better. Uh, and I show that to my students too. I'll say, oh, you don't know how to use these tools right now? Well, that's okay. I didn't either when I started and here's the proof, right? So it's it's good to have that, I think. And it's fine to model vulnerability for our students. They that it helps them to feel safe again. So I, I included this, I, I tell students this quote, I have them read this article from Kardik Chandra, who is a PhD student in MIT in computer science. Uh, and wrote an essay in higher education early on. This is from April of 2023. And what she said was, the question to ask about writing is not, will AI make it worthless, but rather, what could possibly be more important? In a world flooded with the monotonous slurry AI excels at producing, power lies with those who can and do speak for themselves. Never have the skills of independent critical thought and expression been more vital than in the AI era. Uh, and I do believe this, but I, I also think this was pre-Claude. <laughs> so those of you who've played around with Claude AI, it's not really that monotonous slurry anymore. It, it's fairly decent. I, I don't ever tell my students that, but if they asked, you know, if they wanted to fool me and get away with it, uh, they could probably use Claude. <laughs> It'd probably work. Uh, but I think when we think of monotonous slurry, a lot of us have been in the trenches with that. The uh, I had one conversation with a student of mine um, where I asked him why he was using the word moreover. <laughs> he was like, he just kind of grinned and he's like, yeah, that's AI. And I was like, uh-huh. And where's your citation? And where's your acknowledgement statement? And he's like, okay, I'll update it. So, you know, feel free to call your students out. We do recognize this stuff. It's fine to call them out when we see things. But, uh, but overall, I'm really thinking existentially here, like, does writing matter? I don't know. <laughs> right? So uh, I, I decided that after that initial experience in November of 2022, I kind of fell right into it, started using AI pretty regularly, and I was already working on this project, Critical Worlds. Uh, it was an open education resource to replace a $75 textbook. I know that'll resonate with a lot of you, and uh, this was actually the idea for a project that got me into open in 2019, uh, but circumstances and COVID and lots of things pushed me toward the Write What Matters textbook first instead. Uh, so finally, I had an impetus to really get this book done because the textbook was going out of print. And uh, there were a lot of things I didn't like about the textbook anyway. So I was like, okay, I'm diving in. I started writing the textbook, AI came along and I said, okay, yeah, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm actually going to co-write this textbook I'm, and I'm gonna use chat GPT 3.5. I say it's because I wanted to use the tools my students had, but really it's just, I was too cheap to pay $20 a month. I felt like my institution should pay that. And now they finally do. And I love them for it. I love the 4.0 and now I guess we all have access to it. So uh, yeah, there's definitely a difference between four and 3.5, but uh, this is what I was mentioning. Um, and I do really view this book, This those of you you don't have to nerd out on literary criticism, but I do view this book very much as a co-written model. So like, look how bad I was at first, right? Like, these are not real articles. <laughs> I was just making articles up. Some of you remember that, right? Um, but then toward the end, I'm getting much better um, in like giving it roles. Um, it's helping me to come up with questions, to ask about things. And, I, and I've just like tried to be very transparent. So these links out, these all go to the, to the threads. Uh, the only one that I used for for was the eco-criticism thread um, because my school finally paid for it. But I, I think this can be fun and illustrative. And then what I like, again, looking back at it is how much I learned. Now, let me, let me see if I can find a good chapter to demonstrate how this works. Well, Let's take a look at eco-criticism. So um, this is very much a co-written text, which means I've written some of this and ChatGPT has written some of it. And if you wanna see exactly what ChatGPT has written, you can look at that chat and you'll see exactly what it wrote. But then I've pretty heavily edited it. I've added information from Cheryl Glotfelty's book. I've, you know, I've brought in a lot of stuff. Um, then 
I brought in primary text, so that's not ChatGPT, but I absolutely used it to help me identify approaches. And again, I decided as a subject matter expert, do I want to include that? Is that right? Do I want to edit it? But you know, the basic language, the drafting of this was very much ChatGPT. Uh, my friend Catherine let, uh, let me use this poem, so it's all right, rights reserved. And she also let me, again, I got permission, put it into ChatGPT to help come up with some questions about the poem. And then I also came up with my own questions. So some of these are mine, some are ChatGPT. Um, I, I did the thesis statements just because I'm old school like that. Uh, but, but so you can see kind of what a co-writing, uh, I definitely did the eco-criticism scholars. It's, I, th I still feel like Wikipedia is a better source for this kind of information than ChatGPT right now. And also ChatGPT will tend to miss um, like diversity with scholarship. So it, it's not always uh, mindful of that, right? Where, where we want to be. Uh, so, but then the really fun thing, and my students love this, and I have my students do the same activity, are these generative AI model essays. <laughs> so I was like, I, I used a really tough poem. Those of you who know the canonization, this is not an easy poem to read. I was like, all right, ChatGPT, let's go to town, write, it, write a paper on this. And look at this, boy, this is one of its favorite metaphors, right? The tapestry and weaving, like that is just its go-to, right? So um, I mentioned I use ChatGPT4 for this. This is the most robust of the essays. GPT4 is a better writer. Um, and then what I do is I go in and annotate the heck out of it. So I highlight terms that are good that I would want students to use if they were using this type of lens. Uh, and then I go in and I talk about how I feel about it. And I say, oh, I actually like what this does. You know, if I were writing, I would probably situate the this poem within the pastoral poetry genre. You know, here's some other things I would probably do if I were writing this. So here's how I'm different. Um, and students really appreciate this because it shows them like what a bare basic model expectation might be, but then it also shows them how to take it to the next level. I don't have a student example yet. Sorry about that. Um, but then they have the same um, when they're doing when they're practicing eco criticism. They can um, work through the poems, and again, I used it to help me come up with some questions for each of those. And I encourage students to do the same thing that I did and to test out, like find their own favorite poem and have it uh, and and have ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot. I've used a lot more Copilot lately because our students were Microsoft school and they have access to that. So uh, that, that shows you, you though what a co-written project was like. And I'm not gonna lie, you guys, I couldn't have written a textbook. I taught, I kind of built the airplane while it was flying. I, I taught and wrote this in fall of 2023 and refined it in spring of 2024. There's no way with the course load I teach uh, and my service obligations, I could have just written a textbook by myself in that time period. But with AI, I was able to write a textbook and my students really liked it. So I've been collecting a lot of student feedback on it. They felt like it was very straightforward and they've specifically commented on those AI model essays and the way that I interacted with the essays as something that was really useful for them. So I, I think that can be front, really fun to take a look at. Um, and and that, that's an example of where you can you know, contribute to instruction with artificial intelligence. But again, teaching your students and you yourself, like I've got to fact check all that stuff, right? Like I can't just assume that it's getting things right. Uh, so it's more useful, I think, when you are a subject matter expert to co-write and, and that's not really necessarily where our students are yet. And stressing that to them, I feel is important. Uh, another place I used it this term that was really fun, I I've just been going back and forth. I'm like, you know, students don't wanna write another essay. So I, I had an essay in my English 102 course this spring in the middle of the semester, I, I asked students, I was like, you know what? I don't wanna grade an essay at the end of the term uh, and we're doing so much with AI. I wanna switch this up and do multimedia instead. And they were enthusiastic. They thought that sounded great. Uh, so I've shared out the assignment instructions and the resources, uh, definitely encourage the use of AI. One thing I want to show you and how I encourage the use of AI that, that turned out really, really well, I've just finished grading these, is one of the assignment instructions was they had to come up with a generative AI prompt that would produce content. Oh, ah, take out of the trash. I don't want that in the trash. Okay, but, but this would um, actually 
be a, an example of writing in their field. So they would ask ChatGPT to produce it. And these were some samples I gave them, like you're a registered nurse working in a pediatric clinic, create a brief handout for parents that explains the importance of vaccinations, use a helpful and friendly tone, right? So I had students create their own prompts that would produce writing. Then they tested it out in two different LLMs. And this was a really, really fun exercise for them because there were clear differences. Uh, I think students who use Chat GPT 3.5 and then um, chat GPT 4.0 were kind of amazed by the difference in terms of uh, the quality of what they got. Uh, some students tried Claude out for this one. Uh, Copilot was one that was easy for us to use. So this type of thing, again, you could probably work this into any course where you're having the students create a prompt and then test out the prompt with a couple different AIs. That was It was fun to see what they did with that. And then an example, I'm sharing this with Chantal's permission, back to that permission form. Uh, they, they had an option if they wanted, they could create a blog or a Substack. Chantal decided to do that. And uh, she decided to use AI to generate images. And these are the creepiest things, y'all. Like how many hands are there in this picture? Or this baby, <laughs> I don't know what's going on with that. Or or this, so strange. So. Um, she, you know, she's got all of the requirements that are in here and then and then she's included, like this is the example I was talking about, the natural birth plan that she asked ChatGPT and then she went into Google Gemini and then she analyzed them. She said she preferred Google Gemini and she's thinking, you know, thinking about it. And then here's her comment on the images uh, and they were too creepy to not share, she says. So yes, this can be a really interesting thing. And it does bring up, if you do use image generation in your classroom, and I have been using it very intentionally, do be aware that you can get some really creepy images. Uh, I had a student who got a very not suitable for work image. Uh, he was a firefighter. He was writing about firefighting. And um, yeah, he called me over and he was like, what do I do with this? And I was like, report that. <laughs> We should not be seeing pictures like that in the classroom. So be careful with that type of thing. Uh, yeah, I, the images to me right now are still just not quite there. Uh, and then there's just a few other resources here that I've shared. I mentioned briefly my essay feedback. Uh, I've used this tool for two semesters now. I'm finally getting around to writing up an IRB because uh, most most of what I have is just very anecdotal here. And I, I'm, I don't have permission to share out the students' results, but it's a very intuitive platform. You can do peer review th through this platform as well. And students really, really liked it. So it's um, locked down. They don't have the concerns about sharing their work in terms of privacy and it becoming part of the data training set. Um, but, and they liked that. They liked knowing that it was there. You can see the AI results. So you can go in and, and say, hey, this is what I like about the AI results. Here's what I don't like. And it was an interesting experience because I also asked the students to provide feedback on the results. So I asked them to be very critical and, and to basically tell me, what do you like about the feedback? What don't you like? What's useful for you? What doesn't make any sense, right? And um, I would say about 95% of the time, it gave really great feedback. I designed the prompts and about 5% of the time, it gave weird feedback. So again, it's, it's good for students to kind of share and see how this works. Uh, but whatever we're doing with writing, I think it's important to remember that if you don't like boring writing, um, Melanie, it's not. Uh, it was free for me because it was a um, pilot and I'm not here to promote any products either, to be super clear. But um, you could email, Melanie, you probably could email Eric Keen as a developer, shoot me an email. <laughs> like, But mm -hmm. I think it costs, it's going to cost $12 a student. And the reason it's not free is he would make it free, honestly, but it's the token cost, right? So there's, a, as, as we know, there's a cost associated with uh, using these tokens. And uh, I, I know he was able to write a grant to keep the cost down, but um, yeah, it's still, there's still a cost that he realizes. So, uh, but it's, I think there will be other tools like that. I shared that one because that's the one I've used and my students really liked it. They felt more confident as writers. Uh, and again, I'm gonna try to get some actual data on that uh, next year. So keep in mind that uh, if you're assigning, assigning boring writing, why wouldn't you expect students to use generative A on it? Because you know what? I'm using it on all my boring writing. I mentioned my promotion packet. Uh, yeah, I 
used AI in so many different ways in my promotion packet. And I, I had a very strategic reason for doing this. My, I felt at least that my school's approach to AI had been kind of flat footed and not very coordinated and that like people weren't really paying attention to what was going on with AI. And I wanted to call attention to it. I was up for promotion. I knew senior leaders would have to read this thing or at least look at my cover pages. So I, just used a bunch of different AI tools <laughs> and I and I linked to my chats and uh, I you know so here's what one place I you know I brought in like my teaching philosophy and I had it critique that and help me I, I can be kind of tangential I bet you can figure that out from this presentation but it helped me to really focus on the things I needed for my CV I wanted to make sure that I was highlighting my strengths I went to Claude and Claude helped me out with that um, for my summative, I just, you know what, I did not want to add verbs to my CV. So I just asked, this was Google Bard at the time, now Gemini, I asked Google to do that for me. I was like, hey, would you write my narrative? Obviously, I reviewed it, right? But I was like, I don't want to write that. That's boring writing. Um, and then finally, I used it for student evaluations. Um, I figured since these were anonymous and there's no student data tied to them, I felt okay about putting it into Copilot. Uh, and I also used our secure Copilot back to those privacy concerns. And um, and so it gave me some trends, which were actually really helpful. And then finally, I used it for, uh, for showing how I can use it for professional development. And I used perplexity for that one. So this was my chance to kind of show our senior administration how AI could be used and how it could be helpful to faculty and staff. And I'm very thrilled to say as a result of this, I think we're going to have a campus wide committee where not just faculty, not just Center for Teaching and Learning, who's been amazing, our CTL has been really great, but we'll have everybody from all across the campus, representatives coming together from marketing, from student services, coming together to talk about AI and sharing knowledge. And I, I feel like that's, going to be a really important approach. So uh, so yeah, uh, and I do I do make a note, I, I try to model for my students where I am citing and acknowledging, but I'm not really citing and, not, and acknowledging stuff that I would have previously used a template for. And I'm not, definitely not citing when I have it tone check difficult emails, but it's been fantastic for that. <laughs> so, so use it that way. If you have a hard email to say to send, have it go through and neutralize it for you. Um, and then the final, I have just a few minutes left, and then I want to hear from some questions from you all, is with creating, and this is where I'm having the most joy and fun <laughs> with, with these tools right now, and it's bringing it back to students and, and how this can help with creativity. I love this, um, this quote from Oggs Akar that Ethan Mollett quoted on his blog. What is more enduring and adaptable skill that will keep enabling us to harness potential of generative AI? It's problem formulation. So Oggs was moving away from the idea of um, prompt engineering that we all think about. And he was saying it's going to be more about problem formulation, which I believe is true. And that to me is the heart of creative thinking, right? So how can we use it then for fun? <laughs> this is an image I created to go along with this collaborative poem that I wrote <laughs> with, with ChatGPT. It was National Poetry Month and we had a great old time. So I was like writing about electric sheep, right? So it would write a line, I would write a line, and we put it together, and then I edited it, and I asked it what we should call it, and his head echoes in the circus circuitry. I said, I think ghosts in the machine is better. It agreed with me, because it's nice that way. And uh, that can be fun, right? It was, it was just really fun. Uh, I created that avatar on my first screen using generative AI. Um, there, there are issues if you're a woman trying to create any kind of image. I'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, I used it in one of my first year experience business courses to help students create logos. This was super fun. So I had a student creating the land of learning and we walked it through a bunch of different concepts. And you know, you can see it just gives you a bunch of different ideas, right? So it's not necessarily doing the work for you. It's giving you some ideas. Uh, and then I love this prompt from Joel, so I shared it with you all for career advice, and we use this in CWI 101 too. We tested this out with Snapchat AI in my CWI 101 class. It was really, really fun. Snapchat AI did a great job in giving the students some career advice. So lots of fun ways to use it. 
And I'll end on this note with, I think uh, our first keynote quoted Mark Watkins and I've got a Mark Watkins quote as well uh, from this week. So Mark has had some time to think about uh, the new launches that have come down this week. And he wrote, we are in a grand public experiment with AI no one asked us for. Quite a few of us are going to great lengths to ignore the reality of how quickly our world and interactions are now exposed to automation. With this latest release, I don't see that position being tenable any longer. Education is being ushered into this new generative era, whether we like it or not, and we can either take a position demanding ethical and transparent behavior from developers and adopters, or risk being ushered aside in favor of sweeping technological change. And uh, yeah, if you, you know, I've shared a lot of fun things that I've got going on with AI. I, I hope you're having some fun with it too. But if you're also some days, you're just like, what the, yeah, all of that is extremely valid. Back to where we started with concerns about ethics and concerns about what our role is as faculty. These, uh, we just came through a very difficult change with COVID and a lot of us have change fatigue. Uh, what I told my administrators was this change is on the level of COVID, but you don't have the government telling you what to do. So you're gonna have to figure it out, right? And that's, it's exhausting sometimes. Uh, and. So I think we're all within the open education movement really well positioned for this period because we already know about advocacy. Like we've heard about advocating for student textbook costs and things, right? And now we can advocate for the importance of humans in the education process and make sure that we always keep our, our students at the center of any work we're doing. We always consider those concerns about digital equity. Do our students who need these tools and will benefit from these tools the most have the access and the knowledge they need. Uh, so I'll kind of leave us with that. Uh, not really a Debbie Downer, I think, but uh, yeah, we are in interesting times kind of observation. And then I would love to see questions, comments, anything that you all have for me. I'm hoping you have been sharing some stuff on that Google Doc as well. So that summer reading list, those of you who have not shared anything yet, that would it'd be a great time to go add some stuff. <laughs> All right, so yeah, any questions you have for me or comments or just things you wanna share? Come on, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone have any questions? It's a Friday afternoon. Oh, Heather, go ahead. Why is Claude so much better than like ChatGPT 4.0 or, or Heather. others? That's such a great question. And I don't know. It's I wonder, like, I wonder if it's the constitutional model. So those of you who kind of followed the nerdy aspects of this, Claude was built uh, in a different way than the other tools have been built. Um, but I don't really know. It's just if you play around with the different tools, you'll find they kind of have their flavors, right? And uh, Claude just has, I don't know, it's, it just sounds like more human, I would say, than, uh, than certainly chat GBT 3.5, right? So. I forgot um, there was one question. Yeah. Um, when I copy and paste my own work into generative AI, does it store it for use in other things that it does? Usually, yes. You should read the terms of service. <laughs> oh, wait, oh, wait, let me see if I can find this. Sorry, I know I'm still sharing my screen, but. Oh, shoot. I have a great, I didn't create this, but Tori Trust. Do you all know Tori? I didn't even think about grabbing this. Um, let me think where I could find it. Tori Trust has a fantastic, uh, she has, oh yeah, here it is. It's her AI and ethics presentation, I think. Let me see if this is right. Yes. Okay. I'll share this. And she's Creative Commons licenses too. So, uh, yeah, how many of us do read those terms of service? I don't know, but uh, we should get our students used to doing it, I think. So she did, she read through the terms of service and she can like, she's like, yep, for, for most of them, um, they, do, they do reserve the right to take your stuff. So yeah, <laughs> and, they're, and they're, it's a data heavy model, right? Like, so they always knew they were gonna need lots of data and, uh, Gosh, I mean, even thinking about the evolution, how how we got where we are today, right? Like first you had to build the internet to collect all that data. And then you had to convince people to put tons of stuff online. Uh, and social media has certainly helped with that. And now they've got all this data and we can create these tools that write, right? So 
yeah, it, you should read the terms of service, but in most cases, yes. Um, okay. Yeah, someone said in the chat that AI hallucinates about 20% of the time. Joseph, I hope I made that clear. You know, one thing that I really want to go away and fast is if you go to like a Google search now, it'll give you that generative AI answer. Uh, I caught it on two very different things where it was just factually incorrect last week. And I would not have known unless I just recently read a book. I was trying to remember the name of uh, Ulysses S. Grant's appointee to the Indian Bureau of Affairs. Uh, he was the first native uh, Indian Bureau of Affairs leader. And I could not remember the name, typed in a Google search. The, I did get the correct name, it was Eli S. Parker, but the facts that it gave me about Parker were completely incorrect. And I only knew that because I just read a peer reviewed article about Eli Parker. <laughs> so, which, you know, if I hadn't, I would have had no real reason to question it. I think you should question everything. So that's great. Um, boy, there's lots of good stuff coming in. <laughs> Let's see. Yes, there's a question up here. I'm always overwhelmed by resources on AI. <clears throat> Me too. Yeah. How do you yeah. focus your research to be more specific with what you're looking for? Well, I, I hope this helps. Like it is really overwhelming. So the resources that I have shared on that uh, summer reading list, the, those are the people I follow. And Sometimes I'll add to that list, but in general, like it's just been, that's been a reliable way for me to manage my content, right? Just to stick to those, those resources and those people. And I know a lot of those people too. So I feel like I have that relationship of trust with them. Uh, so I feel like uh, it's useful to find some trusted voices right now and to follow them. Otherwise it is a fire hose. I think a few of you have said this. <laughs> Yes, I really like, um, you shared it, Ethan Malik's One Useful Thing mm -hmm. substack. I, I find that helpful and really readable. So maybe yeah. if you're just going to choose one thing. Yeah, he's um, great. The thing is, he's a real AI proponent. And I think it's important, like I linked to Leon Furza's blog, for example. Leon Furza is like, I don't want to say he's opposed to AI. That would mischaracterize him. But Furza is is much more cautious than Moloch. And so it's good to kind of balance that out in the people that you read, I think. Other questions? Gosh, there's so much stuff. <laughs> Sorry. There was another one. I, um, it, there is a lot of stuff here. Yeah. Um, thoughts on this, quote, the prevailing regulatory and legal response to generative AI will limit or even negate its benefits. If society hopes to achieve the full potential of generative AI, we'll need to adopt a new regulatory approach quickly. And that's from Eric Goldman's article. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that article. And I hope you put that in our summer reading too. I know less about the regulatory environment. I am a member of one of the class action lawsuits just because my book was, my book, The Price of Silence was one of the books that was scraped in the Books 3 data set. Uh, I know I attended one meeting with one of our attorneys who felt like the 2015 Google case. Uh, you know, so with the AI companies, there, there's a great New York Times article that kind of outlines all this, but basically the AI companies are saying, well, we can use all this stuff under fair use. And the background and the, and the precedent for that is Google's search engine. So our attorney at least thought they had a, a good case under that, that it's a transformative use of the material. Um, I'm in a really rigorous <laughs> discussion with one of my own personal mentors. If any of you know Jonathan Poritz, uh, he was my mentor for the Creative Commons licensing course and we've gotten to work together as colleagues and he's now in Italy. He's working with the European Union on regulation and we are in a very heated debate right now about whether AI is plagiarism or not. And he thinks it flat out is. I think I'm more swayed by the fair use argument. But that again could be, you know, I, I don't see, I tend to license most of my stuff openly. So I feel like at least my own mindset here, I'm like, well, I do take a pretty open approach most of the time, so have at it, uh, right? Uh, I don't know, uh, but yeah, I don't know where I am on these things. There's so many huge questions, right? It, my most recent Substack, I said, I have more questions than answers. And that's just pretty much how I feel about AI most of the time. <laughs> so, and yeah. I did just share my slides for someone who wanted them. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I, I was in a discussion recently and I, I feel like in the open community, we've historically been like very anti big tech or big business. And like, they're the ones producing these 
tools. So it's like our knee jerk reaction can be like bad, like we should not use them. Um, But at the same time, like they're, they're really doing a lot of what we want. We want, you know, I think it was Elizabeth Hornsby this morning in her totally interesting presentation who pointed that out, right? Like it's open AI, (laughs) you know, and, and really the potential for digital equity is, is tremendous, I think. So yeah, it's like any tool though. (laughs) uh, Yeah. So much stuff, you guys, any, any other, um, more ethical AI models. Yeah, Sarah, I think that my sense of it, and I'm not an expert on this, but my sense of it is that Claude has at least tried to embrace an ethical model with its constitutional model toward development. Uh, But you you could do more about that. Oh, Joanne, like Joanne says, I wish I had time to really dive into all of this. I feel the same way. So like, I think on my previous, no, on this slide, like I have been meaning to go create a GPT for that literary analysis textbook, because let's face it, Foucault is hard, Derrida is hard. Um, but I, I just haven't had time. Like it's, it is a time suck. And my other concern really, when I go back to those productivity hacks, one thing that I've talked about with senior administration and advocating for these tools is just because I can now do certain things faster doesn't mean you should give me more work, right? So that's one of my big fears as a faculty member. I think someone on here mentioned they taught a 4-4. I teach a 5-5 and do service. So yeah, (laughs) I I don't know that I can handle more work. I need these digital tools just to keep up with my regular work. So. Yes, somebody in the chat said something similar. AI was supposed to make us less busy, but like many forms of technology, it has made us busier. Now yeah. I'm thinking about how we have to stop plagiaristic uses of AI. So, you know what? Yeah. Like, okay, I I want to really briefly address that plagiarism comment, and I get where you're coming from. I'm an English professor, right? But I'm actually going to test out a any use goes of AI in my English uh, 215 mythology class this summer. I used to have pretty limited, uh, like if you look at my syllabus training, I have like specific use cases that students could use it for and some things they can't. And I've decided as an experiment this summer to say, hey, anything goes as long as you acknowledge and cite, like go for it. Because I'm actually really curious. I'm, I'm kind of curious to see uh, first of all, am I giving boring writing? Because if I am giving boring writing, I'll get some feedback with students turning in, you know, chat GBT work, right? Like that's feedback for me. But secondly, like I've been really clear that I'm going to grade them you know, based on the quality of their content. And frankly, some of the content AI puts out is crap. So, you know, at the end of the day, your name's on it. <laughs> See how it goes. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like you can remind them that if the writing is as good as AI or it is AI, then why should someone hire you? They can just use AI. So. Yeah, I think it's University of Nevada, Reno, like a couple of their comp classes this summer, they're actually having students compete with AI for the papers. So like the teachers have AI write the papers and then the students have to try to do better. And I was like, that is next level. Our students love games. They love competitions. <laughs> so that could be a fun approach. But I I think when we think about plagiarism, I mean, I remember there was a study that came out in December of 2023. And like the good news was like students aren't cheating anymore with generative AI than they cheated before, right? And and, like the bad news is like 60 to 70% of students were still cheating. I think in one of the groups I'm in a discussion with, like we're reminiscing to the good old days when I was a graduate student at UCLA, like it was a positional arms race. We knew the frat houses had tons of filing cabinets just full of papers on every topic so we would sit there as grad students and try to brainstorm the most obscure re- questions we could ask for papers or like you know, it's like we knew they had these access to these things so uh yeah students i think students cheat for a variety of reasons um i don't i tell i tell people i don't have time to be the ai police and there will not be a checker there won't be a checker for it so you got to find another way to deal with it Oh, I love this comment. Joseph Dudley said, I, the speaker mentioned that big problem is te- non-technical people are understanding AI through science fiction. And I found that to be largely true. I'm wondering if, uh, if I fall into that category sometimes. <laughs> Definitely a sci-fi nerd. <laughs> so it's <laughs> a really good point. Uh, well, I think we're just about at time. I've had so much fun with you guys today, though. Thank you for letting me participate in this amazing conference. It's been so fun.
Thank you so much, Liza. This is wonderful. <laughs> what a treasure trove of information. So oh. great. And also fun to listen to. So thank you so oh, much. Good. good. Thanks again, everybody. Hey, keep in touch too. I have my contact information on their Discord or whatever. So I'd love to stay in touch. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much, Liza. And I get to just sort of wrap this all up. Uh, I just wanted to end it by thanking the committee again for all of your super hard work and Mandy uh, and Ben for the Discord um, and the entire committee for everything that you've done. Also, thank you to Ohio Link and the Michael Sports Library. And of course, thank you to our keynote speakers and the presenters and you, the attendees. Um, it's been such a great day. Please look for a follow-up survey that we'll be sending um, and hopefully we will see you all next year. So thank you so much. Bye. Bye everybody. <laughs> thank you. Andy, thanks so much. Yes.